please welcome to the stage Joel, Dan, and Lee. All right, hi everyone. I'm Joel Marcy, developer advocate on the Facebook open source team. So we're winding down F8 2019. I hope everyone's had a great time, maybe learned something a little bit, had some, got some good swag. So as a developer advocate, one of my main roles is to work with the development community to be, well, an advocate for its needs and pain points and recommend our open source projects when we can. One of our most impactful open source projects is GraphQL. And today we get the honor of speaking with two of the creators of GraphQL, Dan Schaefer and Lee Byron, about its history where, and where the project is going. But before talking with our guests, I just want to level set the conversation a little bit. First, let me ask the audience, how many of you have heard of GraphQL? Please raise your hand. I assume most people did, yeah. That's cool. um, now do the same if you actually use GraphQL in your everyday development. About half of those, okay. For those that don't know, in a nutshell of all nutshells, GraphQL is a specification for an API query language. If you know about REST, or maybe in a previous life, SOAP, GraphQL falls into that same spectrum. At the heart of GraphQL is a description of the data provided by the API. Then a user asks for a specific set of that data and receives back the results associated with that request. No more and no less. GraphQL was invented in 2012 as a response to coming up with a better news feed for Facebook. And this year, we transferred the entire GraphQL project to the Linux Foundation. And in between, there were a set of open source projects released that formed a complete development stack built around the focus of the product designer and developer for both web and mobile. And the community around the stack has grown around the world. So now, let's talk in lightning fashion, fireside chat-wise, about everything in that timeline with Dan and Lee. Welcome, Dan. Welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So Dan, what was the impetus for the creation of GraphQL? What problem needed to be solved that couldn't be solved with other technology? Yeah, when I think about the creation of GraphQL, you really have to rewind back to 2012 and even a little bit beyond. And it, you know, it's almost hard to imagine now, but in 2012, we were not you know, a company that had a native mobile app for our newsfeed. We, did, you know, we were using HTML5 to build it, and we were rapidly coming to the understanding that, that we needed to have a better experience on mobile in order to give people the app that they wanted to use. And so looking at sort of the technology shift that that entailed, we had to take you know, what was a stack designed to power just a server rendered www.facebook.com and come up with some way of powering this mobile client. And we had the Graph API and we had FQL at the time, but we realized really quickly that neither one of those exposed sort of the full uh, power that we had on the server to build these really rich experiences. We had this layer known as Ent that was actually you know, co-created by Nick Schrock, who was one of the co-creators of GraphQL as well. And it had all of these capabilities that had been built, built out, the ability to you know, query not just the object, but also a lot of the properties of the object underneath it. And we wanted to figure out a way of bringing that power to the mobile developer as well. One thing I think is pretty cool is uh, just how deeply baked HTML was into how Facebook worked. Like literally, if you asked for newsfeed stories from the newsfeed backend systems, they would come back in the form of HTML. Because uh, just the core assumption was that we were rendering a website. And I remember, because I, before I worked on uh, GraphQL and, and the mobile applications, I was working on the mobile website. And it was even a frustration to us because we'd have to then like, figure out ways to mush CSS onto this HTML that was coming directly out of the feed APIs so that the, it would work just on the mobile website itself. And that's sort of one of the fun things now is we went through this process as we were creating GraphQL of making it so the feed story was not returning HTML. And then as we saw yesterday, now we have the new www.facebook.com, which can be client-side rendered, powered with React and Relay. Yeah, it's come a long way. And Newsfeed's been kind of the core of the story of its origin then. And now, seven years later, it's still kind of powering new versions of Newsfeed. Uh, every day, but it's it's kind of crazy that it started with that iOS app yeah. um, and all around like trying to shift to native. And you know, originally we didn't set out to like build new API tech. It was just like, what does a newsfeed API look like? And we had like a draft of that, and we we're like, this we really. We just want our server-side APIs. Yeah, so that was 
pretty much how you and I first met is you were trying to figure out the new Newsfeed API to power the iOS app, and I was working on sort of this internal, like, what's our representation of a story in this you know, UI agnostic way? How do we get the HTML out of it? And then we met, and we're just like going side to side and comparing them. I was like, wait, these are the same thing. Like, <laughs> They're we the want to thing. have our API. <laughs> what you wanted on the server is what, what I wanted on the iOS app. And I think that's exactly what GraphQL brought is, wait, we already have this concept of the graph within Facebook and now within, you know, I think a lot of applications. Uh, these are the objects. These are the connections between them. Mm -hmm. We know what those are. Why is it that our API doesn't let us, you know, query them the way that That was like a crazy realization was everything on the server is thought of in terms of a graph. Like Facebook's first <laughs> mission as a company was like map the social graph. Like graphs are core to Facebook. And graphs are also core to iOS engineers, not just at Facebook, but everywhere. That's like the way that core data wants to think about objects is a graph. But all these existing API technologies like completely ignored the concept of a graph. Like REST APIs, resources, and FQL, which is a variant of SQLs, like tabular data and relationships in tabular data. Uh, but none of them were like centered around the concept of a graph. So we've graphs on the client, iOS app, graphs on the server, it, like it felt like something was missing. We were smooshing it a square peg through a round hole. Yeah, we had this impedance mismatch in the API layer where it's like, it's graphs on the server. Let's think about it this way for the API just so that we can rethink about it on graphs on the client. It's like, why are we doing this conversion in between? Yeah, there were a lot of different angles that led us to it. So in 2012, it was created to solve these pain points, right? And now it's like this very popular open source project, very impactful around the development community. Lee, what led to the actual open sourcing of GraphQL? So when we first built it, we had no thoughts about open sourcing it at all. Um, and the idea came up a couple of times. And, and as a team, we actually pushed back on it. We thought GraphQL is kind of complicated. And you really only need it if you're doing something as complicated as Newsfeed. Right. Um, but our, our mind started to shift on this when we started open sourcing other tools that we were using uh, across our organization. So I think the, the biggest one was React. We open sourced React in 2013, just a year after we created GraphQL. And initial reception was rocky. People didn't like JSX. Um, they, eventually, people came around. I think React is an extremely healthy community now. And, uh, and we learned a lot from that. We learned just how valuable it was to have an open source project around this, both to have a community built around the technology they were using, but it also like, encouraged higher code quality of that code base. Um, and then we wanted to, there was just this active conversation going on about, so React is like the V in MVC. That was like an early way that we pitched it. People were like, well, what about the M and the C? Like, uh, how, do you, how do you complete the story? Because React wasn't a framework, it was just a library. And so at the very first React conference, um, Actually, a talk that Dan gave with another one of our, our coworkers, Jing Chen, uh, just shared the story of how we were using React as part of an overall ecosystem of tools that included Relay and GraphQL. Um, and we got just this wild response. People were blown away, and they were like, OK, awesome. Like, When are you open sourcing GraphQL and Relay? And we're like, That's not, <laughs> that was not the intention of the talk. Right. We just wanted to like, explain what we were doing. Uh, but it totally shifted the way that we were thinking about our projects related to open source, in particular the Relay team. The Relay team was like, yes, let's open source Relay. We're really excited about it. The community's really excited about it. We want to do it. Uh, but realize, like, it, what would that mean? Like, you'd have to o also open source GraphQL for Relay to make any sense. Uh, but like, GraphQL is this PHP library, right? Uh, it, it was a PHP library, and like, I don't know, how many people here have a PHP backend that you are using every day? <laughs> I see a couple of hands, a couple of hands. <laughs> PHP's not that bad. Um, but we didn't think it would make a huge splash. Um, and even if it did, like even if people were using it, we didn't want it to be like just a PHP thing. Um, or even if we ported it to another language, we didn't want it to be just that language's thing because we saw it as like a useful abstraction no, mar no matter what your backend looked like. One of the things that we saw after the talk is, you know, we had these sample, you know, GraphQL queries on the slides. And one of the things that we did, because they were slides and, you know, you're building slides like, ah, that doesn't quite fit. Let's just, let's just like, massage it. It's not going to actually be valid GraphQL, but that's fine. People started reverse engineering GraphQL from the slides. They're like, this is cool. We want to build this. Let's just take this syntax that's on the slide that's not actually what we were using internally and build something around it. And so I, there's like a Ruby version of GraphQL and yeah. a Python version of, Graf, of GraphQL. Like, the GraphQL slides yeah. from Dan's presentation. Uh, they reverse engineered them, made these libraries. I, I feel pretty bad about that. I wouldn't have massaged the slides if I'd known people were going to reverse engineer it. <laughs> but it kind of informed how what our open source strategy should be. We decided that actually the idea of GraphQL and like the, the query language itself was what was interesting, not the code base that made it work. Right. Um, and so we, we translated it all into a specification. 
and open source specification, and then also made like a reference implementation that mirrored that. And so be people are free to use the reference, re reference implementation, but the real deliverable here is the spec, and we sort of like a Hail Mary, like we said to the community at the time, please implement GraphQL in your language of choice. Yeah. Um, and we, we expected like maybe three or four people would do that. Um, but by the end of that year, so like six months later, there was 12 different implementations um, in different languages, all built by different people in the community, which is pretty cool. And now today, a lot of those are like core critical projects relied on by like Fortune 100 companies. So if we take GraphQL to the present day, right? Now we've moved GraphQL to the Linux Foundation. So that happened a couple months ago, right? How does that move benefit the GraphQL community as a whole? And what do you see as the future of GraphQL in this new context? So we created a new thing. We created the GraphQL Foundation. Yeah. So that's made in partnership with both Facebook and the Linux Foundation. So the Linux Foundations, they of course help maintain Linux. Uh, but the other thing they do is they create they say like foundations as a service. Uh, it's really cool. They, they, they're also responsible for the JavaScript Foundation, the Node.js Foundation, and a bunch of other really important pieces of, of technology. They're also responsible for the um, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, yeah. which uh, organizes Kubernetes. Um, so we're, we're super happy to be part of the family of all those very awesome pieces of technology. So the GraphQL Foundation is something new that is responsible for the continual development of the specification, because that's still an evolving document over time. Um, and it also creates a home for uh, what, what we're calling tragedy of the commons problems. So anything that any one person in the GraphQL community says, yes, that's something that should get better, but also no one individual wants to step up and own that particular problem, then you want like a consortium of folks that can come together and pool resources to solve that. So uh, all these really awesome companies are now joining the GraphQL Foundation, including Facebook, obviously, but also yeah. Twitter and Atlassian and GitHub and many, many more. Um, and they're, they're actually contributing funds so that we can use those to, you know, hire designers to make our website better and hire developer advocates and hire engineers to improve particular projects that aren't well staffed and, um, and do lots of, of interesting things. One of the things about the Linux Foundation I think was particularly appealing is they have sort of this bring your own governance model where you know, we had already sort of established in collaboration with the community how we were going to develop GraphQL moving forward because one of the things that we realized really quickly is because GraphQL is a specification, like yes, it has the reference implementation, the way it gets developed is fundamentally different than a lot of our other open source projects. And so we sort of organic organically developed over time this concept of, you know, have the GraphQL working group where we'll, you know, get everyone together and discuss potential changes to the spec and what exactly that would mean. And so we sort of had already figured out how we wanted to go about developing in the future. It had just never really been formalized in a way that the Linux Foundation, you know, really cleanly allows us to do while also taking what works and bringing it forward. And I also like the fact you mentioned that we have all these members. We're actually going to be able to do a lot more with GraphQL. But there is this really nice firewall between, okay, this is what the foundation does, you know, in terms of funding and in terms of bringing, like, like you know, bringing almost business needs to the table, and this is the open source project and the technology. And the open source technology is still available just as it's always been to anyone who wants to come to contribute, anyone who wants to come to the working group, and you know, it really is still has that spirit of an. Open yeah, source that's project. a really important point. I'm glad that you that you remind me of that because um, we we were really inspired by how a lot of the programming language communities develop their programming language over time, uh, and especially JavaScript and the TC39 community, but. One of my biggest gripes with TC39 <laughs> is that you have to pay to play. Like, if you want to participate in the evolution of JavaScript, you have to buy a seat on TC39. And that always sort of rubbed me the wrong way, and it le leads to all kinds of like, weird situations in the TC39 community. Um, and so that's something that we actively avoided with the GraphQL Foundation. So uh, yes, you pay to play to have a vote for the budget, um, but you do not pay to play to uh, be part of the specification advancement um, committee itself. That continues to be open for anyone. Yeah. So Dan, as we wind down this chat, um, how do you recommend someone get started to determine if GraphQL is like right for his or her application, and how do you recommend they go about learning to use it? Yeah, so there are a bunch of resources for learning GraphQL at this point. I'd obviously point to GraphQL.org, which is the main site. Um, for me, sort of how you get started using GraphQL is twofold. One is, if you, how many people have used Graphical, the tool? Yeah, how, like, at least for me, I, you know, every time I was trying to explain GraphQL to someone, and, you know, I'd, I'd talk for five minutes or 10 minutes, and they wouldn't really seem to be getting it. And then you like, show them Graphical, and you spend three minutes in that tool, and they go, oh, I get it, can I have it now? 
Like it just <laughs> clicks for them in a way that, you know, it speaks volumes about how important tooling is. And I feel like once you've sort of like gone to graphql.org, you've played a little bit with the graphical, that'll sort of answer the question of like, do I need GraphQL on my system? Because you'll see it and you'll think, wow, this is going to let me do new things. This is going to be empower, empower me in different ways. Or maybe it won't. Like, you know, Graph, GraphQL is not a one size fits all solution. It's not perfect for every problem you might have. But I think it does solve sort of this host of problems that we had and we never had a real solution for anymore. You know, those problems that started with the iOS newsfeed in 2012 that now exist on www.facebook.com, the new one in 2019. And so, like, it's just a new tool in the toolbox that it's really exciting to have and see so many people using. Yeah, one thing that that reminds me of is when, when the GraphQL community was still really nascent and people were really excited, there was this temptation to like GraphQL all the things. Yeah. <laughs> so um, people were coming up with like GraphQL for server to server communication and GraphQL to talk to your database and GraphQL for like lots of different ideas. It was really exciting, like lots of really yeah. cool new ideas, some of which stuck, some of which not so much. Um, and it made it clear that GraphQL was a tool in the toolbox of many things. Uh, GraphQL doesn't like fully replace REST. Um, it, sort of like encroaches on REST's territory. <laughs> there may be problems you previously solved with REST that you'll find GraphQL is a better fit for, but there also may be problems that you solve with REST for which REST feels like the right solution and that's probably right. Um, for server, server communication, we've seen some success using GraphQL for that. In cases where they had problems, GraphQL helped solve, but in other cases, they probably should have stuck with gRPC or Thrift or something like that. So it's pretty interesting to see how it fits into the toolbox. To, to come back to your question about getting started, uh, one sort of angle on getting started that I always thought was like a temporary stopgap, but now have come around to thinking is like actually a really nice end state as well, is writing like a wrapper layer. So if you're sort of have a service-based architecture or, or even microservices, um, there's this concept of an API gateway. So there's like the one place that all of your client applications talk to to then sort of forward those requests on to all the relevant services. Uh, GraphQL like fits really well in that spot. And uh, a pattern that I've seen work really well is to use that spot to wrap over existing REST endpoints. So whether those REST endpoints are publicly available or only internally available to your services, you can then have GraphQL just be the super thin layer that just cleanly maps onto your existing APIs. And what's really cool about that is, you know, like a, a reasonably smart engineer can do that for their systems in a week or two and then quickly get to that point that Dan was talking about where then you can pull up graphical and demo it and show it to the rest of your coworkers and then figure out how to like integrate it into your system from there. You can also just add it, you know, add one thing in GraphQL. You're building a new product, you decide that, hey, maybe GraphQL is how we'll do this and see how it works. I think one of the things that always struck me as being really exciting about adopting React is you didn't have to say, we're gonna adopt React, let's rewrite our entire code base to use it. You're just like, let's, let's write this thing in React and see how it feels and I think one of the reasons why it's been so popular is it's really good. And I think that same thing can happen with GraphQL. When I look at how we adopted it, now we didn't pick something small, we picked Newsfeed, but we adopted it in one place. When we shipped that Facebook for iOS 5.0 in 2012, the entire thing wasn't GraphQL, it was just Newsfeed, but that was really compelling and you know, the developers liked it and we found that it was a really good way of powering that particular feature and would be for others and we slowly adopted it over time as the iOS app grew and evolved. So I think this idea of like incrementally adopt it, try it in one spot, see if it fits, is also another really powerful concept. Well. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Dan, for joining us today on this Fireside Chat. Give them a round of yeah. applause. So as we talked about, if you'd like to learn more about GraphQL and the associated technology, you can check out these websites for more information. And if you want to hear Dan and Lee in even more detail, check out episode two of our new podcast, The Diff. We answer even more questions about the history of GraphQL, where it's going, a lot of cool stuff on there. And I want to emphasize this. Please come by the developer resources hall, which I think is like diagonal from this room. Um, Dan and Lee are going to be there to answer all of your questions about GraphQL. We have the React team there. We have people who've worked on Relay. So come and chat with them one-on-one -on -one at starting around 3.30. And finally, go check out GraphQL to, see, GraphQL to see if you might be able to use in your projects yourself. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of F8. Uh,